day. At the, at the city DTS, we do see how our priorities, techniques, and engineering practices have shifted over time, and as well they should, as our city has grown, matured, and developed. So up until the 70s, uh, Waikiki was a calmer mix of two-way streets until many were converted over into the one-way thoroughfares that we know today. But back in those days, we prioritized traffic flow and throughput for the benefit of the automobile. And this prioritization of the automobile led to a lot less comfortable pedestrian environments over time. And you know, while walking is always less enjoyable, even along the serene waters of the Alawai with cars zooming by at near highway speeds. So Complete Streets aims to promote equity and comfort for all users of the roadway, from pedestrians to bikes, to cars, to buses, to trucks. So tonight is really a first take uh, opportunity for everyone to assess how they use Alawai Boulevard how it could be made better, and what our next generation Alawai Boulevard could look like. So again, mahalo nui for your participation tonight. Historical photo. <laughs> yeah, so this is a, a photo showing uh, back in back when he was talking about when it was a two-way street, we see there's a bicyclist there. Um, so the, the promenade with the trees um, looks quite a bit quite a bit different these days. So we're looking forward to talking about that tonight. Um, as John mentioned, uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, the, we're gonna start with a little bit of a presentation. We're gonna have some polls throughout um, and then uh, we'll break out into discussion groups where we hope that you guys will um, and join us in conversation and share your thoughts, ideas and ask some questions as we go through. Um, we're also gonna just go through a little bit of netiquette. I know we're all more than a year into virtual meetings, um, but we wanna let you know this meeting will be recorded. Um, it's being recorded so that we can share it with other people that we're not able to attend tonight. Um, and uh, we're, we're gonna keep you guys muted to uh, keep the, sign, the sound quality up. Um, and if you need to speak, um, you can raise your hand or uh, put something in the chat box um, and we'll go through some of those functions real quick. So just a quick reminder on how the muting and unmuting works. Uh, there's a little button in the bottom left-hand corner. And if you click it on and off, um, it will start and stop. Uh, same with the video. If you're having issues with the quality of the sound um, or the image that you're seeing, uh, it does help to turn the video off um, while the presentation is going. Sorry, it's not advancing the slide. There we go. Um, and then there's also how to chat, see attendees, and raise your hand. Um, so in the bottom of the, the black Zoom box, uh, there is a participant button. And if you click that, the partic participants will show up either on the right-hand side or in a pop-out box. Um, same with the chat function. And when you go into the chat func function, uh, you can put your comment in there for everyone to see. Uh, and then there is also options to raise your hand, say yes, no. Um, if you have stepped away from your computer, you can also put up a little um, time or coffee mug. Um, next, we have a changing and enlarging the view. Uh, we know sometimes with the shared screen, it can kind of show up small, uh, depending on how the participant's window is included. Um, so if you go to the top, there is a view options. Uh, and you can select from a variety. And then between the participant window and the share screen, um, there's that little toggle that you can move left and right. Um, so just in case the presentation is kind of small and you can't see it, uh, look for that black bar with that little gray, little gray toggle area. Um, next, we're gonna have some polls throughout our session. Uh, so we just wanted to give you guys a quick overview on how that works. Uh, a pop-up box should show up um, and then you select your option. And in order for your option to get to us, you have to click submit at the bottom. Um, so with that, we're gonna do just a quick poll test uh, and then go into our first question. Um, the poll should be launched. Are people seeing it? So what is normally your favorite way to get around Oahu? Once again, this is just a practice poll question to see how it works. Um, 
This one is a select one option. Uh, and when we get a couple more votes, then we'll close it and show you guys the results. Okay. So it looks like most people here this evening so far, uh, the preference is driving, followed by walking or rolling and bicycling. Okay, then into our first question of this evening, uh, we were hoping that you could share a little bit more about yourselves um, so we know who's here tonight. Uh, so select all that apply. Um, do you live in the project area? Do you work by the LOI? Um, do you use the Alawai Promenade frequently or the parks nearby? Walk, bike, drive, just interested, uh, heard about the project or other? Um, and if other, uh, you can put it in the chat box. Couple more seconds. All right, so most people live in the project vicinity, um, followed by, it looks like walking in the area and then biking and driving in the area. Um, so thank you guys for joining us. I see a, a note in the chat box from Bonnie um, that the messaging might not be going to everyone. So I'll have to check those settings. Um, thank you for letting us know that. Um, we'll get on it. And then with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Daniel. All right, aloha everyone. Thank you for joining tonight. Uh, my name is Daniel Alexander. I'm a planner with the um, city department of transportation services. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so I just want to um, talk about uh, some of what our goals are tonight. Um, so um, we want to give you some, uh, some information on some of the concepts um, that, that we're looking at as uh, potential improvements to LOI Boulevard. And uh, most importantly, we want to gather your input on uh, what you think um, uh, would make uh, LOI Boulevard safer for everyone walking, bicycling, uh, using transit and driving. Um, and I just did want to point out um, here in the introduction um, that uh, we have another um, project that you might have heard of, Alapona or the LOI Bridge. And I uh, just uh, let you know this is uh, independent from that project. And uh, if you do have comments associated with that project, the uh, um, draft environmental assessment is currently open and encourage you to go to the project website, um, Alapona. If you just Google that, um, you'll find it and you can uh, submit your comments and find out more information. So let's jump into it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here's our, our agenda for the night. So I'll do some uh, welcomes and introductions, uh, give you an overview of, of complete streets, um, get into some of the existing conditions uh, there on LOI Boulevard, Boulevard that we're responding to, um, discuss some concepts uh, that, that we've put some thought into. Um, and then we have a, a big block of time at the end um, to do breakout room discussion. And that's where we can get really detailed feedback from you. Uh, we do have some polls that we will be uh, getting your input on um, and, and please do respond, but um, we're gonna spend 30 minutes or more at the end, uh, making sure that we can hear everyone answer your questions and, and taking your comments. Uh, next slide, please. So just quick introduction. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, we're with the city and county of Honolulu. So um, Honolulu Complete Streets program here. Uh, we've got a, a number of our of our team members here. Um, I'll just uh, point out um, uh, most of these folks um, have a background just like me, and you're going to get to know them better uh, in the breakout rooms. They'll be facilitating and note taking there. Uh, I did want to point out we have uh, Renee Espiau, um, our Complete Streets Program Administrator here. Um, we have a couple more members of our team, Kelly Akasaki and Aaron Radoble. Um, and we also have Justin Menina on our team. Uh, and uh, we also have our, our great consultants here. So um, Nelson Nygaard, who's uh, um, doing some critical work here. So uh, we have Mike, Michael Reby um, and Drew Van Hagel. And they'll also be um, doing part of the presentation and facilitating. And we have uh, PBR Hawaii 
And um, that was uh, Natalie, who's been our MC so far. And I am forgetting, honestly, all of, all of the PBR team, but you'll get to know them in those breakout groups. Um, and then we have a local um, engineering firm, ATA, that's um, doing a lot of our engineering analysis. So next slide, please. Um, so Complete Streets, uh, you know, probably many of you are familiar with Complete Streets, uh, some maybe not. So Complete Streets uh, is the idea that we need to be um, building our, our streets in a way that safely accommodates everyone. Um, that, that's from pedestrians, um, those with disabilities, um, and those bicycling or rolling otherwise, um, those in transit, uh, and those driving, and of course, freight as well. Um, so uh, jump to the next slide. Um, so uh, that's actually enshrined in, in law. Uh, the revised ordinance of Honolulu um, has in law that complete streets is uh, what we should be doing. So um, uh, that means with every one of our projects, we need to be looking at ways to make that street safe for everyone um, and thinking about um, what improvements we can make. So um, really that's, that's why we're here today is to look at um, these complete streets improvements associated with this, uh, with this corridor here on Alawai Boulevard. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, um, you know, whenever we start a project, uh, we build off of our existing master planning documents. Um, so point to three that um, are really important guidance documents for um, Alawai Boulevard. Um, so we have our Oahu pedestrian plan and um, that plan identified uh, high pedestrian injury locations and the pedestrian priority network um, and um, uh, Alawai Boulevard and several intersections on there came up. Um, I'll get more into the pedestrian safety details later in the presentation. But um, And then we have our Oahu bike plan um, that proposes protected bike lanes, uh, the length of, of uh, Alawai Boulevard. Um, and then the Waikiki circulator study, a more uh, concentrated um, study on Waikiki um, that talked about the importance of Alawai Boulevard for pedestrians and bicyclists and, and need to have more separation from vehicular traffic. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so existing conditions, uh, we're going to jump in and give you some of the existing conditions. Can I get the next slide? Um, so uh, here's, our, here's our project corridor um, there on Alawai Boulevard. It's the one-way um, section of Alawai Boulevard stretching from Kapahulu Avenue to Kalakaua Avenue. And um, you can see a couple other complete streets projects we have uh, ongoing. Uh, Macaulay and University also highlighted there. Um, Next slide, please. Um, so uh, this gives you a sense of, of our planning process. Um, so uh, we start off by doing a lot of data collection and uh, trying to talk to as many people as possible about uh, what the needs um, and desires are for the street. And then we start to put together some uh, preliminary concepts and uh, we, we then take that back to the community um, and uh, try to get something that um, is, is a winning solution uh, for everything we've heard and everything we found out. Um, and, and so we're somewhere um, in that um, stakeholder outreach, the preliminary design and the community events area here. Uh, next slide. Um, so uh, we've got several uh, images here. They're all captured on Google Street View. And, you know, we did this just because, you know, this is what the Google Street View car captured on its way down LOI Boulevard. This is, you know, just a, a day in the life. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we have lots of pedestrians, uh, we, have, uh, we have bicycling, uh, we of course have motorists um, in certain areas there on the Mackay side, you can see uh, we have a narrow, a narrow sidewalk um, and it's uh, with someone deciding to bike on there, it's a little challenge um, and uh, some, it's just some of the realities that, that we're seeing out on the street. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, working our way further west, um, uh, we see uh, we've, we've got actually someone someone running in the bike lane. Um, and next slide, please. And then here near the, the western end near McCulley Street, uh, we see people riding in the road. Um, um, no bike lane in this section, and we see someone in, there biking biking against um, against traffic up on the sidewalk as well. So, you know, and of course, uh, people driving. So we see a street that has all sorts of activity going on, and some of it um, is challenging and uh, we'd, we'd want to improve on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, uh, you know, 
you know, uh, LOI Boulevard really has two segments in the area we're looking. Um, so uh, the, the more diamond head segment, which uh, extends to Coneana, uh, Keoneana Street, um, has uh, the bulb outs with the vegetation and palm trees and parking recessed, um, and has three, three lanes. And then uh, the furthest EVA section uh, goes into four lanes and has no parking um, and a much narrower um, landscape strip. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so um, some about the Waikiki community. So uh, these, are, these are some of the really important variables here. Uh, we know that uh, compared to Oahu at large and just in general, uh, Waikiki experiences a lot of walking, bicycling, um, and transit use. Uh, and I'll just note these, these figures we're looking at here uh, with nearly a third of all the trips in Waikiki occurring by uh, one of those active transportation modes. They're for all the trips coming in and out. So that's inclusive of the employees, the tourists, um, everyone that comes in and out of Waikiki. If you run these numbers uh, for the commute mode for um, the residents of Waikiki, you find a much higher percentage they're actually using uh, walk, bike, and transit. Uh, but this is just a, a full scope of the uh, transportation activity going on. Uh, next slide. Um, so uh, one, one really important thing that you find for residents of Waikiki um, is there's very low car ownership rates. Um, you see, it's kind of the inverse of what we see elsewhere on Oahu. Um, you know, a, a nearly a third of residents don't have a, a car at all. And uh, then the vast majority either have uh, zero cars or one car, and very few have, have more than one. Uh, yeah, this is for households, actually, I should say, uh, which is it's kind of the opposite when we look at the island at large. So uh, we have a community that walk bikes and takes transit a lot, and a lot of them actually, um, either by their choice or, or by the circumstance, actually don't even have a car, or they don't have a car for you know each, each person in the household. So they, they're using these means as a necessity at this point. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it's just a summary, uh, you know, uh, give you a sense. It's, it's 45 times more likely um, that trips are occurring by walking, biking, and transit in Waikiki um, than they are uh, in Oahu in general. Right, next slide, please. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, we actually have another poll or two poll questions right now. Um, so the first one is, how do you typically access the area? Um, this one is a multiple choice question again. So uh, select all that apply. Of course, if there's if there's another mode that's not on here, uh, it would be interesting to see and feel free to share share that in the comment box um, in case we missed anything. Give it a couple more seconds. Oh, running, yeah. Didn't include that one. Thank you, John. Five more seconds. All right, uh, still at personal vehicle, um, followed by walking and rolling, and then personal bicycle. Um, for Kendra, definition of role. Um, we've been typically including uh, wheelchairs or people that may need to push strollers as part of that, that rolling category. Um, then the next question that we have is, how often do you use the area? And this is just select one option. And of course, other, if you have an other, um, skateboards could count as rolling. Christopher, I may have missed that option when putting this poll together. If it's once a week, <laughs> uh, you can put that in the comment box. Sorry about that, guys. All right, a couple more seconds. Uh, most people here use this area every day, um, followed by a few times a week 
uh, and then between once a week and once a month. Um, nobody never uses it. Thank you, Kendra, for your comment as well. We will, we will note that. Um, with that, um, we have another question, and this one is open-ended. Um, what are assets on Alawai Boulevard that you value? Open view plane. Thanks, Winston. Open view. Oh, they're coming in so fast, I can't read them. Any other facilitators want to chime in on some of these? Views, uh, no Mackay curb, ease of access and egress, paved running trail, view plane and cycle lane, bike lane and watching the paddlers. Quick artery to Ala Moana downtown, access to the canal, walkability and open view, view plane, canal, breeze, Malka views. Oh, comment widen Macaulay Bridge walk access. It's a nice walk and dog friendly. Walking, access to Alamoana Park. Golf course gives trade winds. I didn't think about that, Sharon. Walkable with dogs. Um, and there's quite a few more that I couldn't read fast enough. Um, thank you guys so much for sharing that. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it back to Daniel. And if you guys are still thinking of things, feel free to, to send them in. They're getting captured in our chat box and we'll make sure to um, note them. Yeah, mahalo everyone for uh, sharing all those thoughts on, on uh, what's valuable on, on Alloy Boulevard. Um, so I'm gonna uh, get into some of the, the challenges we have um, some of the safety realities that we're responding to. Um, so this is a, a five-year period, and um, it maps out the, the um, EMS attended crashes. So that's uh, folks that had an ambulance come for them, um, so serious injuries. Um, so there's uh, 107 um, on our corridor in that area. So um, that's, that's around 20 a year that are occurring. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's a, significant, a significant number and, and something we need to uh, be thinking about how to respond to. So um, next slide, please. Um, uh, really wanted to emphasize this one. So um, as, as I noticed, part of our Oahu pedestrian plan, uh, we did uh, analysis to identify where we have high pedestrian injury intersections. Um, and uh, the whole island uh, we looked at um, and five of them popped up on our study corridor here. There are uh, those, those uh, red red uh, circles there. And um, so you see, these are areas we, we really need and we really know that we need to give some attention to, to pedestrian safety. Uh, but, you know, as I noted from the second, those um, stats a second ago, uh, we really do have uh, safety issues throughout the corridor that uh, we can improve on and we should be improving on. So next slide, please. So uh, one of the critical things here, uh, we, we know um, that speed in general um, is uh, a really important factor in whether collisions occur or not and the severity of those collisions. Uh, people uh, going faster have uh, less of an opportunity um, to uh, see someone. Their uh, field of vision narrows, um, their uh, reflexes slow, and their stopping distance slows. And that leads to a greater probability that uh, they might run into something. And also we know the severity um, is very much associated with speed. And so um, the speed limit on Alawai Boulevard is 35 miles an hour, um, which honestly for uh, an urban corridor with uh, such high levels of walking and bicycling uh, is very high. Um, this slide kind of denotes that severity issue I'm talking about and it's um, your chances of survival as a pedestrian and the same would go for someone on a bike as well, um, uh, being hit at different speeds. And we know even with that 35 mile an hour speed, which is already very high, that um, we also do see a lot of speeding on the street. And I think anyone that's driven down it knows that uh, many times a day you can uh, go 40 or, or even greater. 
So uh, speed is definitely something uh, that we need to be thinking about. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this uh, slide just goes over um, some of the uh, planned and existing bicycle facilities in the area and uh, just point out um, the connection um, to the to the pass on the eastern end to uh, both there on Kapahulu Avenue and towards Paki Avenue. Um, and then uh, this would connect with our uh, future Alapono Bridge and the connection to uh, existing bike lanes on McCulley Street and eventual planned uh, bikeways on Kalakaua Avenue. And really, you know, this, this um, covers the length of Waikiki. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, parking, uh, you know, so that's one of the aspects of the street. Uh, it has uh, just over 200 parking spaces along the section that we're looking at. And uh, we know here, here on the right, we've done two major um, studies of the parking use on, on uh, LOI Boulevard. And uh, both found essentially the same thing, uh, that utilization is, is very high. So, you know, it's, it's hard to find a spot. Anyone that, that's driven down there can, can attest to that. Um, but we also know that um, the turnover is extremely low. So um, very few people are actually using those 202 spots. Uh, this one was over the course of, of nearly two days and um, only 482 vehicles uh, used that, that 202 spaces over that um, two day period. Um, and uh, I'll point to the other side, and this is to place um, that public parking that we have on the street in context of Waikiki. Um, so the big number is uh, there's just over 6,300 public parking spaces in Waikiki, and that's uh, both ones that you would pay for off street and ones that are on the street, um, some free, um, and but are available for someone to pull in uh, as a member of the public and use that parking. And so um, our LOI Boulevard represents about 3% of that total uh, parking supply. And um, in relation to um, how it sits to all the street parking on Waikiki, there's another significant chunk of uh, street parking um, elsewhere from LOI Boulevard. Um, so uh, next slide. Next slide and next poll. Uh, so this question is what mode needs the most improvement with this project? Um, we have walk or jog, uh, bicycling or rolling, motor vehicles. Um, this is a select one option. Uh, once again, we're just trying to get a sense of uh, what people are feeling. Um, and we still have plenty of presentation left uh, about improvement concepts to date. Um, so if I will launch this poll. Sorry, I forgot to click that button. <laughs> um, <laughs> so if you could uh, just select the option. Um, and once again, if there's an option that you would like that's not included, uh, please feel free to put that in the chat box. And we do have a lot of questions coming in about parking. Um, I think the breakout groups might be a good place to kind of discuss those, um, but we have tracked them in our chat box as well. So thank you for that. All right, well, we're a little shy of our last respondent level, so I'm gonna wait a couple more seconds to see if we can get it up there. All right. So um, people said bicycling and rolling needs the most improvement with this project. Um, thank you guys for sharing that. Um, I think with this, uh, we're gonna move on to our improvement concepts. Um, Drew, are you there? Oh, Natalie, yes. Thank you. Okay, awesome. In this part of the presentation, we want to show you some of the concepts we're considering to address the safety and complete streets deficiencies. 16 of the 20 intersections between Macaulay Street and Kapahu Avenue may be suitable for curb extensions, and they're shown as blue on this blue circles on this diagram, those 16 locations. Next slide, please. Curb extensions maintain the main driving movements at the intersections for large and small vehicles while slowing down their speeds as people turn the corner, which is essential to um, improving safety. There are extensions of the corner that place people waiting to cross out from behind the parking lane and in more plain sight. Next slide, please. 
In addition to the slower turning speeds, which are safer, pedestrian safety is improved by reducing the number of feet and the amount of time people walking are exposed to moving traffic who might be looking more closely for gaps to make their turns than for people trying to walk. Finally, with a curb extension, people waiting to cross are more visible and yield compliance by people driving is higher because they can be seen faster and more easily. We wanted, we wanted to show on the next few slides some examples of curb extensions, which commonly support the existence of on-street parking because they are placed on the corners where parking is restricted to increase visibility while still providing the benefits that I described before. On the next slide, you can also see in terms of the physical design of curb extensions, we always aim for raised concrete as shown in the foreground on the left. Um, but due to drainage or other feasibility, feasibility issues, we may consider options with modular curbs or delineators as shown in the background on the far side of this photo. These can become attractive canvases for street art by local community members. Next slide, please. Lighting is critical and, 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 and uh, an enhancement to mark crosswalks is an important feature to all the complete streets work. The visibility is critical for safety of, safety of all roadway users during the dark hours, and we will also be assessing the lighting for potential improvements. This image shows the computer modeling software used to assess lighting. Next slide, please. It's a pretty long distance between traffic signals on Alawai Boulevard. This means people who are trying to cross the street have to either walk a long way to cross at a signal or that they might have to wait for a long time for a gap in traffic or attempt to cross in places where drivers might not expect them and are not as likely to yield because of the complex in driving environment there. According to the complete, complete streets guidelines as well, marked crosswalks cannot be installed alone on a street like this with more than two lanes because the research shows that it does not improve safety conditions alone to put in place marked crosswalks only. So we're wondering if a new signal at Nahua with a marked crosswalk would be appropriate as it is about midway to the closest signals which are spaced about four blocks or a quarter mile away to offer this additional crossing. Um, on the next slide, please. There are also, um, there are a protected bikeway is another improvement option we are considering. A two-way bike lane would make connections to existing and planned bikeways as shown by the, that were shown on the heavy green lines uh, for people riding bicycles to ride both directions between a planned and existing bikeways. There are two options we're considering. One which um, which uh, goes the, the, the full length as described here and one another one which would have, um, can you go to the next slide? <laughs> or was it the pre, yeah, thank you. An another option which has um, fewer trade-offs for the driving and parking um, context of the environment and would connect with um, uh, Midway. Um, connecting with the proposed bridge. A protected bikeway is um, the current conditions, sorry, the cur current conditions along much of Alloy Boulevard are illustrated here. There's a bike lane in the same direction of travel. Between parking and fast moving traffic, we know the existing conventional bike lane is relatively high stress and just isn't the kind of bikeway that makes people feel safe and comfortable bicycling. Between Keoniana Street and Keoniana Street and McCulley Street, there's no bike lane and bicyclists share the lane with traffic. We've heard from many that this area serves as a major barrier to cycling on Alawai Boulevard and in Waikiki. You can see the, the person on a bicycle there using the actual lane striping that separates vehicle lanes as their bike lane. And here's some similar precedents that exist already to, for two-way protected bike lanes. They, these ones are on South Street and on South King Street, where the flexibility in design allows for one travel lane to be used. On King Street, the flexibility in design allows for one travel lane to be used for peak hour travel by people driving and still be available for parking the remainder of the day. Well, bike, bike facilities have a big safety benefit for people bicycling, but they have major safety benefits for everyone that uses a street. These include speed reduction, which benefits all road, roadway users, reduced pedestrian crossing distance and exposure to moving traffic, increased visibility of people walking, and a better organized street for all the road users, a dedicated, everybody is in their lane, a dedicated sidewalk for pedestrians, a dedicated bikeway for bicyclists, and dedicated travel lanes for motorized vehicles. And we know that, on the next slide, please, we know the positive impacts from national studies, but have also documented here locally that on King Street, where there's been a 50% reduction in pedestrian injuries since the protected bike lane was installed. And this is just exactly the type of benefit that we're looking for as we implement the complete streets policy and ordinance islandwide. 
And now I'm going to turn it over to Mike to just discuss some of the parking management trade-offs that can be parking and travel lane, parking management and travel lane trade-offs that can be made to accommodate the needs of people driving while still making it safer for all. Thanks, Drew. Aloha, everyone. Um, so as Drew said, we're going to be talking about uh, bikeway trade-offs. So uh, when we're installing, it, when we're looking at installing an improved bikeway on Alloway Boulevard, it's going to require some trade-offs um, with the limited amount of space available between the canal and the property's Mackay. So those are two fixed things that are not going to you know, move. Um, so we're going to run through some different options that we'd love to get your feedback on as we go into the breakout rooms. Um, and so we'll start with this first one. Um, this would be the remove a travel lane option. So right now, most of Alawai Boulevard um, has three lanes with parking as Daniel described earlier. So this is the upper right um, uh, diagram that you see here. Um, so this scheme uh, would move that parking that exists right now over into one of the current travel lanes to preserve that parking. And then it would carve out enough space to install a two-way bi-directional um, bikeway. So you're using the existing bikeway width and uh, by pushing the, the, uh, the parking over into the travel lane, you get a, enough space to uh, carve out this two-way bikeway. Um, and if these curb extensions can um, be removed, so these are the curb extensions on Alloway Boulevard where you, um, at the intersections where you see trees, uh, we would be able to retain 100% of the existing parking supply in this scheme. And I think there was a question earlier um, in the comments about the curb extensions that were being described earlier. So those curb extensions would be on the other side of the street, um, Mackay side, and they would go into the side streets. So these, those curb extensions would not extend. We were not able to create curb extensions that go into Alloway Boulevard because there's a travel lane there, as you can see in this diagram. So just to answer that question. Um, and then so we'll look at the next scheme here. Natalie, if you can go to the next one. Um, this option, um, the opposite's being done. So this is the remove parking um, option. So the third travel lane in this situation would be preserved. So uh, you're keeping the same number of lanes and you're installing a two-way bikeway where the parking lane um, and the existing bike lane used to be. So you'd have enough space to do the same uh, treatment. Uh, this scheme would actually require the removal of the curb extensions on the canal side uh, to work. Um, just because of uh, the amount of space you would need to um, get through there and maintain those three travel lanes. Um, and just a note, um, for all these alternatives, we did not consider using the uh, remaining landscape strip on the Malka side. Um, it's uh, about the 9.75 feet that you see here. Uh, so we'll need to preserve this area for the uh, flood control project. So we can't really touch that space. So that's another thing to consider as we're looking at these trade-offs. Um, and so now we'll go to the next option. I switched it. I see that, thank you. Sorry, I was lagging on mine. Uh, so this one is a combination of the first two options that I just showed you. So we'll call this the part-time parking removal lane. So the peak hour tow away lane, you may have seen this um, around town. Um, it's quite common um, on uh, some streets that uh, receive heavy uh, peak hour traffic. So this scheme would add parking restrictions on Alloy Boulevard for the peak hours of the day. So in the morning and the afternoon when the additional capacity is needed, uh, this lane would be a travel lane. And then off peak, so for most of the day, probably you know 20 hours or so other than the morning and afternoon peak hours, uh, parking would be allowed just as it is now. Um, and so what we're seeing in our preliminary uh, tra traffic analysis, which the data we collected was before COVID, so it was during um, typical uh, traffic, is that um, not all three lanes are needed 24 hours a day. So the times that you could have um, this peak hour lane are flexible and it could be determined by further traffic modeling. Um, and so this option actually is a compromise of having enough travel lanes when you need them and then parking for most of the day when the parking is needed. Um, this design is similar to some stretches on the South King Street bikeway where there's um, off-peak parking allowed and um, a travel lane during peak times where people are uh, turning as a left turn lane to get um, uh, further uh, Malka. And another thing that this option does is the tow-away lane um, assists with parking turnover. As Daniel described earlier, um, this 3% of the supply of all the parking in Waikiki on Alawai Boulevard um, not only is it a small supply amount, but it's also not being turned over because there's no restrictions and it's free. So um, having this daily um, restriction would allow the vehicles to get cleared out so it can be used by more people, um, some uh, the different parts of every day. And then finally, um, the curb extensions that we mentioned earlier on Alloway Boulevard would also need to be removed in this scheme. And then lastly, 
um, just to make things a little bit crazier. Don't worry, there's not a test and we'll have the breakout groups to discuss this if you have any further questions. Um, this option is basically taking um, the peak hour tow away option and then the remove travel lane option and combining them and changing that um, uh, up at some point mid uh, corridor. So with our traffic studies that uh, we know that um, as you go diamond head, the daily and the peak hour traffic decreases significantly. In fact, um, uh, near Kapahulu, there's basically more, less than half as much traffic um, as there is um, near Macaulay, where you reach your peak amounts. Um, and so the map on the bottom kind of shows um, Wailina as an example. So, you know, we aren't deciding where this would be right now, but basically, uh, if you imagine this is kind of a sliding scale. So at some point along the corridor, um, as you go from um, Kapahulu, Eva, uh, you would have a uh, travel lane that's removed. So you would preserve your parking where you don't need the full three lanes. Then where the traffic begins to build enough to the point where you would need it during the peak hour, you would change the parking configuration where there's a peak hour restriction. So um, this is actually fairly common too. Um, North King Street has this um, configuration going into town. Uh, it has parking and then it turns into a peak hour uh, restriction lane to add that extra lane where you need the uh, extra parking uh, vehicle capacity. And then lastly, um, all of the options that we just showed have a bikeway at the street level. So like the ones you we showed earlier on um, South Street and um, South King Street. Um, and these are the ones that have been uh, getting installed over the past few years. But um, for this project, we also wanna think about long-term goals. So this option shows a raised uh, fully shared use path that allows people to ride at the same level as the sidewalk. Um, and so if this design is advanced further, we'd love to get your feedback on it, but we're also gonna have to consider drainage and cost implications. This would be a much more expensive option um, just because we're raising things up and moving the curb. And uh, we'll have to make sure we're tying it in with the um, uh, Elepono project as well um, at that location. All right. Um, and then next we're just gonna go through some example scenarios of um, typical street users in the area. Um, and so this one, uh, we're looking at uh, Kai, and Kai is a fifth grader. Uh, and uh, Kai wants to ride to school at Alawai Elementary. Um, and um, the, Kai lives in Waikiki. And instead of being dropped off uh, by his dad, um, he wants to ride to school. But his parents are saying that it's just not safe enough. Um, and as you see here, there are the two different routes uh, to school and from school. Um, so there's no bikeway um, for a lot of the trip. Um, and there's fast speed limits and fast moving vehicles mixed with traffic. And then coming home from school, uh, because Alawai Boulevard is one way um, and riding on the sidewalk is not allowed, um, Kai would have to um, ride along Kalakawa and Kuhio and uh, many of those stretch stretches don't have bike facilities. So uh, Kai is just not gonna be allowed to, to, to ride their bike to school because um, it's just not safe enough. And so, now we're going to look at an option where there is a bikeway on um, Alawai Boulevard. So similar, one of the options that we just went through and, and, and went over. Um, so this protected bikeway um, can get Kai nearly all the way to school. And now his parents um, can give him the thumbs up to ride. Um, so the route is nearly the same both directions because now you've added that um, uh, bikeway that you can ride Diamond Head, which doesn't exist currently. Um, and the facility is protected either by parked vehicles or by some sort of raised barrier um, at the street level. And so those are the types of facilities that we're looking at trying to um, design and provide um, because it allows for people like children or less experienced riders um, feel safe um, while they're biking. And then now we'll go to the next um, scenario. So this is someone driving. Uh, this can be um, you know, a tour bus. This could be uh, someone commuting or a, a truck delivery. Um, so this is just someone um, leaving off of lures and they're trying to get um, um, out of Waikiki and head into town. Um, so this option, um, show, this shows uh, a situation where we've done um, traffic engineering to model the changes of reducing the lane um, uh, of traffic and estimate the greatest impacts during the afternoon peak periods. Um, the biggest impact um, that would occur if a peak hour tow away lane is uh, provided um, 
is going to be at the McCulley intersection because that's where there's four lanes of traffic and we would have to uh, reduce that to three lanes to continue the bikeway. Uh, all the other stretches of Alloway Boulevard could potentially have an additional lane. So it would be uh, matching the existing uh, conditions. And so um, this person driving uh, or de truck delivery driver or tour bus um, would take the same route, be able to take the same route that they're taking right now. And uh, they would only experience an average of 23 extra seconds of delay. Um, at the McCulley Street intersection and everything else would be the same. So this number is actually a weighted average of someone going straight or someone go turning right. Uh, right turners would probably experience a little bit more delay than this, but it would be highly dependent on if they're arriving um, at the intersection on green or red. Um, obviously, if they arrive on red, um, they're going to experience more delay. Um, and this is um, just in the uh, afternoon rush hour. So off peak, their travel time uh, probably won't change much at all. And then lastly, um, we're going to take a look at someone walking on the path. And I saw some comments earlier about uh, um, everyone, uh, all the people that I love enjoy uh, walking um, on the path here. So this is Lucy. And Lucy's on an evening walk along the Malka path. Um, it's a six foot wide path with the three foot seawall. Um, and we also have Kainoa. And Kainoa is trying to bike home from work and lives on Alawai Boulevard. Uh, there's nowhere to ride Diamond Head, so um, he's riding on a sidewalk and ends up passing the walker closely, and this is something that we see um, uh, all the time. It happens quite often. Uh, we saw it basically every time during our field observations, um, and we know that it is currently illegal to ride on the sidewalk, but we know that many people still choose to do this because uh, that's where they feel the safest, um, because the, and the alternative is out of the way, uh, requiring to ride, um, you know, further um, uh, Makai on uh, Kuhio. And so now we'll look at the situation where we actually have the bike facility. Thanks, Natalie. Um, and so now this per now the person walking on the canal, um, uh, Lucy uh, can walk without sharing this sidewalk with someone bicycling and Kainoa can now ride home from work in a designated space and um, not riding illegally. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. You can see um, the person riding is now in the bikeway. And uh, we believe that creating this facility um, like this on the street will um, allow the sidewalk to get cleared out a great deal from people that are currently riding on it. And then finally, we're just going to look at um, another um, consideration. So this is a, <coughs> excuse me, um, this is a two-way bikeway between McCulley and Kalakawa. Um, uh, we were looking at options to try to continue this facility all the way down. Um, we did notice that there are um, there's a redundant channelized turn lane, as you see in the upper right hand corner. You can basically turn right and get onto Alloway Boulevard as you go uh, Mackay on McCulley Street um, from two different um, two different locations. So you can take um, either channelized slip lane um, that you want. And so uh, we're starting to think about potentially um, closing one of these off, the one that's closer to the canal and um, turning it into a two-way bike facility. We would have to design to have the crossings work, but um, this two-way bikeway would help people get people further uh, west in Waikiki and towards the Ala Moana area, um, which we think would provide a critical connection um, that can um, uh, uh, facilitate a lot of users. It'll also connect the two-way section that we've just been talking about um, uh, uh, with these examples that we were just showing. And then I think we're going to roll back to Natalie for some polls. Yep, we have a couple more poll questions this evening. Um, this time I'm actually going to click the launch button. Uh, so the first one is which improvements are you most interested in? Uh, we're going to take some of these results into the breakout groups, which are going to be happening right after these polls. So um, the poll is open if you guys want to select all that apply. And once again, the facilitators are uh, going to kind of keep these in mind as we go into breakout groups and uh, can refer back to any of the diagrams in the presentation. And thanks for everyone that's been providing comments. I've um, been trying to track them while multitasking with the breakout groups, and um, I appreciate the, the chit chat that's been going on, and I'm looking forward to getting caught up on all of those. Um, while you guys go to the breakout groups. Gonna give some people a little extra time on this one, um, just because I know there's 
a lot of things to think about and consider. Um, so I'll give a couple more seconds on this. Um, so we have 96 people on the call right now um, and 63 people voted. Of those votes, 78% uh, said protected by claims um, are, is one of the items that they're most interested in, um, followed by, let's see here, speed reduction, um, which I, I saw coming up a lot uh, in the chat box. Um, and then after that is, what would it be? new traffic pedestrian crossing signal. <laughs> um, thank you guys. Uh, and then we have one more poll this evening. And it is, which trade-offs would you be willing to accept uh, to accommodate a shared use path or protected bike lanes? Um, these kind of go back to the examples that Mike showed. Uh, you know, there is a limited amount of space that we are offered uh, to come up with ideas and solutions. So with that in mind, um, select all that apply. And of course, if you have comments, uh, feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, but right after this, we are, there's also opportunity for breakout groups um, where you can share your thoughts and ask questions. Okay, our responses are slowing down. So I'm going to end the poll. Um, and for this one, uh, travel lane reconfiguration was uh, number one, followed by parking removal and then off-peak parking. Um, and then several people responded that they do not support any changes. Um, and with that, we're going to go into breakout groups. Uh, there's going to be five breakout groups. Um, each group will have a member from the project team as a facilitator, and we'll have note takers in there to kind of capture the thoughts from this evening. Um, just a reminder that we want to hear from you, uh, what your experiences are with Alloy Boulevard. Um, are there particular areas that we have not covered or highlighted that uh, we should also be looking at or cause you specific concern. Um, and then what are your thoughts on the, the concepts presented? Um, so those are kind of some, some questions to pique your interest as we go into the breakout groups. Uh, once again, the facilitators will have the presentation if you guys need to go back and refer to anything. Uh, we're going to sit into these, sit in these for about a half an hour and I'll check in with the groups and see how the conversation is going. And we do have a little wrap up after that um, point with next steps and stay involved. Um, so I'm going to open the breakout room. Uh, there should be a little pop-up box that comes on your window and it says join breakout group. If that does not show up or if you're having any trouble, just wait a couple of seconds and I will work with you individually to get you into the breakout group. It just might take me a couple minutes to get through that. So um, I'm going to open the rooms now and um, hopefully the pop-up box showed up. And if not, send me a chat in the chat box and I will work to get you guys into the appropriate rooms.